let's have a prayer. You know the drill. Uh, but those who are visiting with us by the internet may not. And so there's classroom etiquette to be sure that as a believer, meaning that you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised on the third day to give you eternal life. We're under the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit indwells your life, and he's the great teacher of truth. In fact, that's one of his names, uh, titles given to him in John 14 and 15 is the spirit of truth, and it will guide you into all truth. And that's a key to spirituality and learning, both in uh, inhale and exhale. In other words, learning and applying to your life. First John 1 9 says that if you confess your sin, you say, why should I do that, Ron? It's because you can't study the Bible in carnality, and evidence of carnality is personal sin. Because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. That's why. And so what do I do with personal sin as a believer? I confess it. First John 1 9 is one of many passages, but it says if I confess my sin, God or the Lord, he is faithful uh, to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And that's the protocol. I mean, that's classroom etiquette. So I give you a moment in your priesthood, according to first Peter two, every believer is a priest in the church age give you the responsibility to confess and, and be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in learning. We learn and then we live the word of God. And so our Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us both by automobile and by internet. I thank you, Father, Father, for people who still understand the principle no matter how high tech we get that the assembling of ourselves together out of Hebrews 10.25 is still the essential protocol uh, for the church in assembly. This Bible study is an assembly, and we pray that those that are within distance and are able to make it uh, come. And for those who are not able to, uh, to make it to our 6.30 on Tuesday and Wednesday, then they pick us up by Internet. And to do that, they need to have the same discipline not to be distracted in their home by televisions and telephone calls and all those things that you would not be distracted here because we shut them all down for an hour. I thank you, Father, for this time together with these people, both by automobile and by Internet, as we discuss the one choice. When it boils down to one choice, can we make that choice compatible with the will of God in Jesus' name? Amen. In today's lesson, you will see how important obedience to the revealed directive will of God is. You know, there are three aspects of the will of God. We, we talk about it a great deal around here. There's the revealed will of God. That's the directive. That which he tells you, says, I want you to do such and such. And he wants obedience from that. And, and then there's a, the permissive will of God. We choose not to do what God desires us to do. And he puts up with it to a point, and then we have the overruling will of God when he steps in and goes, enough's enough. Now you're messing with the plan of God, and you can't go any further with it, and he shuts that whole thing down. And all of these depend on how you respond to it. The direct will of God it comes with obedience. If you have an attitude of obedience and you, you're positive, listen, attached to it, and you do it, not because you don't have another option or another choice. You do it because this is the one God chose for this time and permissive will of God at some point under divine discipline, you've got to respond to his discipline, his heavy hand on you because he only has your best interests at heart and you don't. And he knows uh, the end from the beginning and you don't, you live it out. That's why it's always good to respond and be obedient to the will of God because he knows the backside of your life and you don't, but you don't know what's coming tomorrow. Do you? No, you, you've got plans, but it don't mean that. <laughs> I mean, how many times your plan has been changed within a day or an hour? A phone call can change your plans dramatically, can't they? Just a phone call. I mean, uh, anyhow. <clears throat> and so, you know, the key, the key to this is be obedient to the directive will of God. What you know to be the desire of God, fulfill it in your life. Doesn't matter whether it's your desire. I mean, uh, You know, apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what I'm talking about. Hebrews 11, 6. Or, or, or Romans 8, 8. In the flesh, you can't please God. 
You can't please God by, by fulfilling your will when it stands in opposition to God's. I mean, even Jesus couldn't do that. I mean, he could have, but that would have been not good. Uh, in this lesson, we'll see how important obedience to the, the revealed directive will of God is to a believer's life. Now, this is what's, what's kind of interesting. God always prepares us if we're positive. Even if, even if we have, even, if, even when we're half-hearted, if we're positive, not wholehearted, but half-hearted, you know what I'm talking about? He still is going to give you all the preparation necessary for the, the next step in your journey. He does it with Jacob. Just before leaving home, Isaac sets Jacob down and gives him a wonderful talk about his leaving. And I'll tell you why that aged parent did that, because Jacob, Isaac may be dead before he gets back. And the reality of that was closer than you might imagine, if you know anything about this story. <clears throat> Before he leaves home, the aged Isaac sets him down and has a conversation with him. And I'll tell you why. Because both these men, and Isaac knows that he's on his way out, and Jacob don't know that he's on his way in. And his dad knows it because Jacob's on his way out. Isaac is going to die, and he's going to be the heir apparent of the patriarch promise. Agreed? Which is the Abraham covenant. And the whole thing is about the seed of Christ. He's going to be, he is the heir to the messianic seed. And this is a wonderful discussion. You can read about it in, uh, not now, but in, in Genesis 28, 1 through 5, he goes through and he lays out the Abrahamic covenant and how important he is in it. Jacob. And, and, and he's an aged man. And this is the heir apparent to the Abraham. In, in other words, this is, and so he has a very serious conversation with him because I may be dead before, I may be, I may be dead. Be, now that may be true with everybody, but it's certainly true when you're ready to die at the right age bracket, right? And so this becomes more prevalent in your mind. I mean, Jacob doesn't think that way at, at his age. Uh, but you see, Isaac does because Isaac is at that age. Uh, of it and so he thinks this way even though the boy doesn't it's his over his head but boy even though this was important that Isaac have this discussion about the importance of the Abrahamic covenant and he is heir apparent okay so they have this wonderful day. now this is really important to this whole lesson now did you get what I just said he has this great discussion about the Abrahamic covenant and the messianic seed and how he's heir apparent you got it I mean, it's a, and it's a wonderful, when you read it, it was heavy. I mean, the old man really, I mean, this is like a deathbed kind of discussion with him. Okay. In this lesson, you will understand how important it is to pay attention when God eliminates all the choices but one, because that's exactly what's going to happen. He has this big discussion. You're the heir of the messianic seed. Through you, the messianic seed is going to come. That was the big message. You got that? Oh, yeah. That's a big message. You know, it's the seed, the land, the blessing. And he talks about all that. All right. And he's going to get a wife. I mean, he's going to leave, but his, one of the purposes is to find a wife there, right? The, the, the parents lay this out for him. You know, come back, but come back with a bride. Okay. And listen, Isaac would have probably said to him, listen, it turned out good for me, son. I mean, this, is, this was one of the best decisions my dad ever made for me. And if you study, and we have uh, the servant of Abraham that went out and got that, got that uh, bride, got Rebecca, he prayed all the way about that thing. I mean, he prayed, 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 prayed that, that lady into Isaac's life. It's the darndest thing. It's a great story. Uh, but anyhow, so we're going to look at four things about how God can eliminate to help you make one choice. God just keeps eliminating all kinds of things in Jacob's life to boil it down to one choice. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Point number one. I got four points. Just prior to arriving in Meso... Now, this is really important. Just, just before arriving in Mesopotamia of Haran, 
just before getting there, the last stop on the way, the last rest stop on his way, <clears throat> Jacob experienced the revealed directive will of God delivered by a, a theophany. That's an appearance of God in some form. And this is very famous. Everybody knows this, but they don't pay any attention to it. It's what's called Jacob's Ladder. You remember Jacob's Ladder? It, it, listen, if you've had any kids, you know Jacob's Ladder. Right? I mean, it, this is a very... Jacob, the children... This is one of the children's stories that's way above their head, but they love it because of Jacob's Ladder. Climbing up Jacob's Ladder. You know it. All right? This is, this is it. When he stops at this rest area... Rest area He, he has an epiphany. He has a, a, a revelation given by God, a theophany. A theophany is as big as it gets under the old covenant. That's as big as it gets. All right? So this is, Jacob's ladder is a big deal. And he, the next stop he's going to be is in Haran. Right? I mean, he, this is the last stop before he winds up with the family he's going to see. And, and he's going to name this spot Bethel, which is the house of God. The L on the end of that is God, and Beth is the Hebrew word for house. It's the house of God, Bethel. And he's going to name it because of the experience of the theophany. He's going to call this the place where I met God. The a place where I met, I, I, came to fa I came face to face with God, Bethel. And he's going to call it the house of God. He's going to name this place the house of God. It's going to, listen, it's forever famous. I mean, what, what happened here is forever famous. Now, I want you to, in 2815, I pulled a, 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 a part of what God spoke to him about. Now, this is a long passage. I pulled one verse out to, to show you what was a highlight to Jacob. Uh, and this, this becomes the personal revealed directive will. Behold, listen to what God says to him. Now, he goes through the whole Abrahamic covenant with him. He goes through the same Shemuel that Isaac went with him before he left. Do you understand? This, now it's God telling him the same thing his father told him that God told him. Do you understand? That you're heir apparent. God shows up and says, you're heir apparent. Are you with me? This is before he ever, listen to me, how important is it? Before he ever gets to Laban's house and meets the girls. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. Uh, you, know, you know what we say? We say, God will never leave you nor forsake you. This is it. This is what he's telling them. I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. Look at, look at what God says I will. That's promises. Here's what I'll do for you. That we call them promises. I will keep you wherever you go. I will be with you and I will keep you. I will guard you. I will guard your steps wherever you go. And you and will bring you back to this land. That's Abrahamic covenant. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, wow. Is that important? That is so important that God is going to eliminate all of his choices out here so he can stay focused because that's what he told him he would do. I will be with you. I will direct you in, in the ways you should go is what he's basically saying. Now, why is this important to you and I? Because we have Romans 4.21, that whatever God's promised you, he is able to, to perform it. I'm not going to leave you shortchanged. Now, he may eliminate a lot of options because they're, they're bad choices that you're thinking about making, so he just takes them out of it, out of the element, boils it down to one. Now, you, you may not choose that one. Now, you're in hot water, right? I mean, you're, you've put yourself in hot water, right? It's not that God's going to put you there. You put yourself there. If you, when he boils everything down to one choice and you don't take that one choice, you're in hot water. You know what I mean? I, I hope so, but because sometimes I use illustration that don't make sense to people like hot water. <clears throat> okay, Here, here's the second thing. So this is really important. Now, he's had, he's had 
two very important meetings with people that's very important in the plan of God. Are you with me? Here's point two. After leaving Bethel, Jacob arrives at Haran and uh, to the home of Laban. That's Rebekah's brother. And there he meets Rachel. And it was love at first sight. You've heard of love at first sight. Well, look, look what I told you about love at first sight. Now, I'm not opposed to the idea, but love can be blind. Right? You can't tell a 16-year-old that, but you can tell a 66-year-old that who's gone through a few of these. Love can be blind if it isn't compatible with the will of God. Because blind, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, blind is all about the devil. God reveals light. He, re he keeps you in the dark. He always keeps you in the dark. He always keeps you in the dark. God always keeps you in the light. Please understand that. There is great danger in love at first sight rather than faith. Right? For the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. When sight takes the place of faith, we call that fleshly-minded thinking of old man cosmos diabolicus thinking. And you're, in, you're, you're way behind a little hot water. You're over your head. And listen, you, you don't realize that when you're making these choices, until you look back and wait, wow, I made, that was the dumbest choice. I can't believe I made that choice compared to how it wrecked my life. When sight takes the place of faith, it is what the Bible calls fleshly minded thinking of old man cosmos diabolical. For the mind, listen, listen to Romans 8, 6 through 8. The mind set on the flesh is death. That's temporal death. We've talked about that. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. See, you have a choice. Who's setting the mind here? You are. You can set it here or you can set it there, and the outcomes are going to be different. What a man sows, he reaps. That's a principle. That's a basic principle of life. Even unbelievers understand that. After a couple sowing and reaping destruction, they don't know it. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God. Now, it may not appear that way, but the, all the decisions are moving away from God, not towards him. That's how you know. Are the decisions you're making taking you closer to God or farther away from him? Oh, well, uh, that's not going to be good, right? You don't have to have a lot of theology to talk to somebody about those choices. I mean, are you moving you know, deeper into the woods or are you getting further out of the woods? So he said, but the mindset on the spirit's life, the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God. Now watch. It does not subject itself to the law of God. That, that's that revealed word that says this is the will of God. And once it is revealed to me, it, can, it becomes law. You understand? It becomes law. For it is not even able to do so. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So that's, you know, you say to Jacob, Have you checked her? I know you've checked her form out, but if you checked her soul, where is she spiritually? So we can move that young person or that individual away from sight into faith, right? Sight ain't going to get you anywhere. It, actually, what you think you're do, going into a relation with the eyes wide open, you're blind as a bat. Yeah, once you, once you give up the whole faith base, uh, 
to maneuver and manipulate and do this and do that, you're going to wind up, listen, which so you reap. How do I know when this is true in my life? You know when you are no longer willing to adjust your desires to the directive will of God. You don't have to, listen, when you're manipulating and doing all these things, manipulating people and working them and doing all that thing, you don't do that with God. You try that with God, and he'll go like, you kidding me. Listen, you know when you are no longer willing to adjust your desires to the directive will of God. That's how you know you're out in the toolies. Yeah. Well, we're all there. It don't matter what age you are. I mean, people in the adult over, over the hill that are living this way. Listen, I hear this so much. I hear this from all ages, so it's not just kids that do this. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, get your, I, here's what I say, then get your crying towel out. Get your crying towel. Strap it to your hip because you're going to need it. Because it ain't going to go well. I know it's wrong. Listen, that's the first clip. When I hear somebody say, when they describe it, they say it's wrong, and I say, well, what do you mean wrong? And I finally, they finally confess what they mean by wrong. It's actually sin. And they're for, listen, they've already been deceived to call it wrong. It is so far beyond wrong. It is wrong. I made a wrong turn. I'll do a U and get back. What are you talking about? This is not wrong when they say that. And I, I may, and when I counsel, I make them call it sin. I'm not going to, I'm not listening to you as long as you keep calling it by names it isn't. It's so far beyond wrong. A person died for what you call wrong. A person died for, died a cruel, horrible death on a cross for what you call wrong. Hebrews 3.13 tells you this is the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 13.13, I mean 3.13. Yeah, it's on your paper. Three, at this point, you have become disoriented. I'm talking about the person in the story. At this point, this person thinking this way has become disoriented to the will and the plan of God for their life. You are no longer interested in finding the guidance in the truth of the word of God. You've turned your back on that to play this stupid game that what you sow, you will reap, and you're in destruction. You're in the destruction lane, not construction, destruction. You ought to be in the construction lane to get something good out of this, but you're in the destruction lane. Nothing good is going to come out of that. What you sow, you reap, and when you sow to the flesh, you'll reap destruction, not construction. John 8, 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth, that's what you get from the revealed will of God. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And when you go against it, you'll put yourself into bondage to the guy who's pushing the other agenda. And that's the devil. He is in opposition to God. It tries to get you at every turn to go in opposition to him, to go in opposition to God. This, this believer is no longer committed to doing the will of God. Listen to me wholeheartedly. I can't tell you how important it is for you to know in your life the difference between half-hearted and wholehearted. And I don't care if you're in a relationship in your marriage or in your family or in your church or with God, half-hearted is no-hearted. It's it, because it's about commitment. Are you in or are you out? You can't be half in. Are you half in the car or are you all the way in the car? A guy who's only half in the car has got a bad ride ahead of him, right? Well, you can ride that way if you want, son, but, well, you, you listen, 
you can't even permit somebody to ride that way, they'll pull you over and give you a ticket. I mean, it is beyond the law of common sense. You can't half-hearted in anything. You, listen, you, listen. Now, I, I didn't have a coach. Coach, would, he would have gave up the whole football team to have anybody on his team. He wouldn't allow anybody to play half-hearted. And I'm so thankful for that. Who allows anybody to play half-hearted? Half-hearted wins nothing. Wins nothing. I don't care how good an athlete you are. Wins nothing. It don't matter. You make 100 yards a game if you lose all your games. What's the, what's the deal with there when it takes, it takes a whole team to win ball games? It doesn't take one person to win a ball game. Listen, I see people who are half-hearted in their marriage. They're half-hearted in their business. They're half-hearted in their church. Half-hearted doesn't work. It's not part. I don't care if you've been born again. Half-hearted does not work in the kingdom. Wholehearted. If you study, I'll tell you a good study. Look up the word wholehearted, wholehearted and read that. And then, then once you understand what God calls wholehearted, now you understand wholehearted from half-hearted. We live with half-hearted people. They just, they're, they... When I was in the Army, if you were half-hearted, the sergeant would tell you what half-hearted was, and he said, I'm going to leave the rest of you to decide how you're going to deal with these people in your barracks or on your squad who are doing half-hearted because in the morning, we're all going to do yada, yada if it's, not, if it's not cleaned up. And he would punish everybody for one guy. He would punish every guy for one guy who did something half-hearted because it put everybody in jeopardy in, in the military. That was a lesson. And uh, listen, he would, go, he would say, I'm leaving it with you, gentlemen, or in the morning. I can't tell you how he phrased this, but it would not go well for you. And listen... We had, a, we had a little military meeting. Half-hearted. I love the story of Caleb. Caleb is one of my favorite guys of all guys in the Bible is Caleb. I put this down for later for you to read. Joshua 14 and 15 is a wonderful read. But here's, here is Caleb, and you know Caleb. He comes out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. Over 600,000 strong soldiers, military-type men. You understand? I don't mean they've been trained to be. I mean they're all, they're all of legal age and ability to, be, to fight militarily. Over 600. That means probably 2 million came out. We just count, they only count men that were military age. Didn't count those younger than military age. Didn't count older than military age. Just military age, over 600,000, which puts us at about 2 million. Caleb was one of these guys. He was from the tribe of Judah. And he comes out. He's excited about going to the promised land. And when, it come, when they get to the border and the 12 tribes uh, select a man to represent their tribe to be sent out to spy the land and to, to look at reconnaissance, he was one. He was the one guy chosen from the great tribe of Judah. It was a guy called Caleb. He was 40 years old. And, and the other man next to him about that same age was a guy called Joshua. And the 12 guys went out. You know the story about the 12 spies. And they came back with a report. These were the only two guys that came back with a positive report that said, you will not believe what God is about to give us. I mean, the grapes are bigger than uh, wash pots and, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, and uh, you, you know, well, it got voted down. The two guys gave their argument as strong as they could on behalf of God. He said, look, this is a piece of cake. And uh, we can take the fortified city. We can do it all. But I'm, I'm telling you, the prize at the end of the battle, the prize is so great, you're not going to believe it. And uh, listen, the same God that took us out of Egypt and took us through the Red Sea will take us through this land. I mean, this is what we've come by, I promise. And, of course, they got voted down. Got voted down. 
no vision. Listen, when you don't have a vision in your heart that God, is, if, if God don't put a vision for his work in your heart, then your combat boots, you never wear them because you don't know what purpose in life you have with them. You'll never put the full armor of God. You listen to the story of the full armor of God, you never put it on. You never put it on. You know why? Because it's every day. It's every day. It's not, it's not when you get in a, punch, a pinch that you put it on. You put it on every day. It's, it's common hardware. Caleb was a guy who wore it every day. Put it on every day. Always wore his combat boots. Ready for warfare. You know, the angelic conflict goes every day whether you're barefooted to have your shoes on. You know, God says put your combat shoes on. Put your combat boots on every day. Put them on. Pick up the sword every day. Pick up the sword of the word of God. And the only people that do it on a consistent basis, are people who have a vision of what God wants, wants from their life in their, to their generation. If you don't, if you don't buy into that, then you're, you're not going to wear this armor. I mean, you say you're in the military. You say you're a soldier of the Lord. I'm in the Lord's army. But you're not because you're never ready to fight. You don't have the vision. See, Isaac is trying to put the vision, a vision of God, the vision that God has for the patriarch into the life of this young man, Isaac. And he tried to put it, listen, Moses had a difficult task trying to put that vision in the hearts of the people whose heart was always half-hearted. They were always going back to Egypt with one half their heart and moving very slowly forward with God because they didn't have a vision. These two guys went out. They came back with a vision they had when they left Egypt. You understand? At some point, you have to, get, you have to buy into this stuff. You have to buy in an issue. You know, so you, coach, he, you, you sign up for football. He issues you equipment. It, you're not worthy to wear it. You know what he does? He takes it back. He says, go find something else to play, son. You don't have a heart for this game, right? And, he, and listen, that's a good thing for the kid and good for the, co for the coach. You put a kid like that on your team, he'll spoil it. Oh, he's sitting around whining, sucking his thumb. And everybody wants to beat him up. This is, the, this is what the church has become. We're, we're, we're people without a vision for God's work. Without a vision for God's work. We don't know, have a, listen, everybody in this room, have, we all have the same vision. We have different roles in it, but we all have the same vision. Let's reach the world with the gospel of Christ. Let's grow spiritually and minister out of us. Listen, if the ministry is not going out of you, it's not going in you. I'm just telling you, you may not like to hear it. So here's, here, here's Jacob. I mean, here's, a, here, here's Caleb. And finally, finally, the 600,000 men, listen, all the 600,000 men have died but two. <laughs> They've all died. The same two that went out and said, let's go get it. They had the vision in God in their heart. 600,000 of the rest of them have died, and we got two standing. One of them is the leader of Israel, and the other is the leader of the tribe of Judah. And now it's time to distribute the land. And Caleb, who is 85 now, still got his combat boots on with a vision of God's work in his heart says, I'll tell you what I want. I want what I wanted 40 years ago when we went out to the land. I want, I want, the, I want the mountain called Hebron. Oh, I know it's, it's got the most fortified, it's the most fortified cities in the land. I know the giants are on the mountain. I've scouted it out. I know everything about it. I want it. I'm going to take it. And he did. You know why? Because he, he understood it's combat boots. You never take them off until you die and somebody else would take them off. When I die, take my boots off me. Because I'm not ever taking them off. I'm, listen, I won't have to worry about the vision I had on earth because I have one for heaven. But I'm, 
I'm that age can't take your boots off of me. Age can't take the vision that the ministry that God has for us, for us, for your family, for your neighbors. This is why Christ died on the cross, and this is why we are still alive. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care how disabled you are. You still wear your boots. When you go to the doctor's office, when people knock on your door, you still have ministry in your heart. Let no one take that from you. And if you don't have that in you, get it in you before it gets any later. This is the message that Isaac tried to give Jacob. This is the message God tried to tell him in Jacob's latter ministry. And you know, when you study this in Caleb, I put down verses, four, chapter 14, 7 through 15, you see, listen to me, the, the marker, we always talk about markers, you pay attention to the word wholehearted and how many times it's used, and then pay attention how, how it's used with him. The word wholehearted. I mean, what God is looking for is, is kind of like what... Um, Gideon, God had to teach Gideon, look for men who will work with their whole heart. Find me fighting men with all of their heart. The coaches used to say to us, I want 110%. That means you've got nothing left. When, you've got, when you're pulling, you've got nothing left, and you just pull it out of your gut. I mean, we always... Practice for fourth quarter. When, when we would go like, when we couldn't lift our arms, when we, our feet couldn't do anymore, and we were just dead on our feet, the coach says, I, we're going to do sprints. And, and you go like, I ain't getting sprints in me. And then he's got to motivate you. And buddy, when it come to fourth quarters and you were down, and everything you you knew in your heart, you could pull this out of the box. You could pull it out because you pulled it out in practice. We never left the field without 110. He made sure we never left it without 110. I mean, after I took a shower, and I, I didn't know if I'd get home, honestly. And yet I walked a, a block down from the ball field to my house. And I, there were many days I didn't think I could walk it. And I'm so thankful for that kind of training. Because he taught me what the word of God is teaching me today, that you do things with all of your heart, with your whole heart. You love God with all of your heart. You, you love it, your, your mate in your marriage with all of your heart. You love your church with all of your heart. You love the world with all of your heart. I mean, anything less than that, anything less than that is not acceptable. I didn't say it was easy. I just said it was unacceptable. And, and, and Caleb is one of those great reminders to me. 85, still wearing his boots, still has a vision of what God wants out of his life. He's, he, it don't matter he's in the fourth quarter. Well, you're 85. I don't care. I'm in the fourth quarter. This, this is the fourth quarter. This is the fourth quarter in life. 85 is the fourth quarter. It's not the end. You're in the fourth quarter. You're looking at 120. What are you talking about? Listen, you're in the fourth quarter. You, what, you're going to quit because you're in the fourth quarter? What, you only a three-quarter guy? What, you only have? Listen, I played with guys. Didn't play with them long. They only wanted to play a half. half they, played, they played outstanding football the first half and wouldn't play the second half. It's like when they went in and sat down, they were done. They didn't last long. My coach wouldn't put up with that. Neither would we. Our expectations are too high. Listen, I can't tell you. I, I'm talking about this stuff because I'm telling you, I believe this is the heart of God. You study the word wholehearted and you'll come to a whole different conclusion about your life. I know I have. Don't be sitting around talking no foolishness to me about, well, you know, I'm 65 or, oh, Ron, I'm 70. I don't want to hear that foolishness. You're in the fourth quarter. What are you going to do? Hang it up? You take your combat boots off? Where's your vision for what God wants out of your life? I mean, you truck along till you, till, till you die. Somebody else takes your boots off. And you, you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Now watch this. We read this all the time in Hebrews 6, 11, 6. But here's the reality in your life. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please him. There's your vision. For he who comes to God must believe. See, that's your, that's your personal responsibility and a commitment that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's the deal. That's the deal. Without faith. Faith is what breeds everything into your life. Faith. Faith in God. Faith in yourself. For when God reduces our choices to one, it becomes especially important to the believer's life and the plan of God. When he goes to the trouble to eliminate all the choices, God has done a great favor to you. And it's boiled down to one, so this is easy for you. Right? Look, teacher says, we're going to have one question on the test. It's multiple choice. I'm going to take, it's three, A, B, and C. I'm going to take A and B off. Right? That's exactly what God does. That's exactly what God does. It's exactly what God does. It's exactly what God did with Jacob. When Jacob got married, he got married to one. Because God eliminated all the other choices. He would have never eliminated him, so God had to eliminate him for him. So that when he woke up the next morning, he had one wife. It wasn't the one he wanted. It was the one God gave him. Because God eliminated all the choices. He made this very easy. And I saw you all laugh when I said, we're going to, one test, a multiple choice, three, A, B, and C, and I'm going to take A and B off. That's just exactly what God does in our life. And we still miss it. We still miss it. We write in. Hey, a multiple choice. Take two out of three off. And we write the answer in. That's wrong. That's exactly what Jacob did. That's exactly what Jacob did. How do I know that for sure? Because I know that Leah was the mother uh, uh, in, with, with Jacob in the Messianic lineage. That's how I know. That's the proof in the pudding, as they say. When God boils it down in your life, the choices are gone but one. Be smart. Don't do no write-ins. It's not... <laughs> I mean, he's done the best he can with multiple choices. Took them away. There it is. Boom. Do that right in. Well, here's what I think. I took it away from that. This is not what I think. This is, you're not going to write me a paper on it. It's multiple choice. And there it is. <laughs> and I took all the choices away but one. Come on, Bubba. You are going to college, aren't you? I don't know. I don't know. When God reduces it to one, listen to me, it is still the direct will of God no matter how much you reject it or run away from it. Still the will of God. When it boils down to one, you may not like that one idea. Look at Jonah. Here's the direct will of God. I wrote it on your paper. He says to him, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to it. And I want you, you're right? You know the story of Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness have come up before me. You would think he'd have loved that assignment. Except he knows the heart of God. He knows that God is not willing that any perish, but all would come to repentance. He didn't like that idea. And this, is, this is the direct will of God. I want you to go to Nineveh, preach the gospel. The people are wicked. Now, he knew they were wicked. They've been wicked against Israel. I mean, this is like being assigned to go to Iran. Listen, little Jew man, I want you to go to Iran and walk through the cities and preach against them. He goes like, I don't think so. Well, Jonah rejects it. He runs as far as he can away from the will of God. Look at 
You can't run anywhere. You can't run and hide from God. But see, he's, he's, he has separated two things in his life. Oh, there's God, and then there's the will of God. I'm not really running away from God. I just don't like his will. I still like God. I just don't like his will. That's the kind of foolishness I hear when people come talk to me. Not, not you, of course, but others. Right? Of course they do to you too, don't they? Of course they do. They tell, they tell you some of the goofiest stuff you ever heard in your life, and you go like, what are you talking about, son? That's stupid. Listen, Jonah rejects it. He runs as far as away as he can from the will of God. You can't run. You can't hide from doing the will of God. Adam and Eve couldn't, right? It didn't matter what they hid behind. God could, you know, God was, they would hide behind the tree, and he was behind the tree. I mean, how are you going to hide from God? I mean, he's always one up on you. In the conflict of wills, Jonah falsely assumes that God would obey Jonah's will without any pushback towards it. See, I meet Christians that think this way. Fleshly-minded believers think it's God's job to make them happy. Oh, yeah, of course. That's, that's the goofy stuff you get from fleshly-minded believers. In the conflict of wills, God always wins. So why would you even start that foolishness? Why would you even start it? Jonah couldn't hide in a boat sailing away from Israel, nor at the bottom of the sea, nor in the stomach of the sea monster. Now, those weren't all of his choices, but God's eliminating things. You understand? God's eliminating choices, ain't he? Well, I would go in a boat. Okay. <laughs> Overboard. Well, okay. I'm still not going. I'll die. But I ain't going. Okay. Down to the bottom, seaweed wrapped around him. Fish comes along. Whoo. Well, okay. I'll still die. <laughs> Spits him out. I mean, what a story. What a story. And I had professors that said this was a myth. That's, this is a mythology. I said, yeah? How come then Jesus said, this is how I got in trouble all the time. How come Jesus said, as Jonah was in the whale or in the stomach, three days and three nights, I'll be in the heart of earth. Listen, if that's, if that's, if that's a myth, so is that, are you saying that the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, burial and resurrection is not the real deal? Are you saying that's a myth? Well, you, you can keep your job at Sanford and say that publicly. I don't know what they meant privately because they, they talked one thing for salary and one thing for students. So, Jonah couldn't hide in a boat. He couldn't hide at the bottom of the sea, and he couldn't hide in the stomach of the sea monster, so he finally surrendered and began to pray to God. In the end, Jonah was glad. <laughs> In the end, he was glad that God never leaves you nor forsakes you. I bet he never ate fish after that, do you? The smell of, the smell of an inside of a fish would be enough for me. <laughs> then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish and the rest of the story we know. He prayed, you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. And boy, had he. And how thankful our heart ought to be towards that kind of an idea. After Jonah returned to God by confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9, he still only had one choice. <laughs> He's gone through all of that. He has put himself through a rigor. And when he gets to the end of it, he gets all done with it. He's still back to that one choice that he had before he left. Like, God ain't changed his mind. Well, you know what? I'm going through to suffer for you, God. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, I've gone through Are you through crying? One choice. And here's what he tells him. The second time, 
I'm going to tell you what I told you the first time. Get your boots on. Get your boots on. You ought to be proud to be on land. This is a whole land deal. This ought to be the happiest day of your life. He still had one choice. God ain't changed his mind a bit about this plan. So Jonah's got to change his. The deal's, that's the deal's still here if you open for it. Put your gospel shoes on, let's go. Listen to what God told Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim the proclamation I told you to begin with. <laughs> Can I tell you? Listen, when your life boils down to one choice, it's the best choice if it's from God's word. We as Christians ought to get on board with that idea, especially when he goes out of his way to give you the big test and eliminates it down to one choice. Be sure you don't do a right in. Be sure you don't do that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way by automobile and those who have dropped in by internet. May the Holy Spirit minister the truth of the word of God that it might set us free from this kind of foolishness in the Christian life. We need to serve you with a whole heart. Some of us have to learn what that means. I pray, Father, you'd begin to teach us what it means to serve God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all the time. We have the opportunity, Father, to reach a whole world in our generation for Christ, our community, our state, our nation, and the world for Christ. It's our generation that has the responsibility, privilege, and the victory. I pray we would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.